10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, The exhibition of 1900 has seen the triumphant vindication of stone. Uh, to be more precise, it has vindicated the appearance of stone, since most of the time it has been simulated for us by plaster and stucco. In 1889, the keynote was on brute strength. It was iron and steel which dominated. Only the Eiffel Tower remains as a daring apotheosis of iron, piercing the sky with its high fretted steeple. But this year, stone dominates, uh, triumphs. You see it everywhere, sometimes massive, sometimes delicate, at times capricious, at times elegant. The architects, it seems, have searched for effects of surprise, bizarre decorative schemes, and astonishing ornaments of plaster and stucco. Abandoning any homogeneity of style, they've piled up the orders rather at random, putting the stress on impact rather than harmony. In fact, exaggeration often shows through rather clumsily, and the amassing of so many different forms presents us with an inextricable conflict between the most opposite of styles. Well, that was from a popular guidebook. The 1900 exhibition was a sort of New Year's Eve party for the 20th century, and it's hardly surprising that some people lost their heads in the excitement. What is surprising is that the whole thing came off at all. It was vast, unwieldy. In many ways, it was ridiculous, and architectural historians have tended to ignore it. I want you to look at it for two reasons. Firstly, as a historical event which drew on the energies and resources of most of the designers and architects of France, and many from all over the world, bringing their work to the attention of nearly 50 million people who came to see the exhibition. But secondly, and I think more importantly, the very exaggerations and confusions of the exhibition should help us to understand the complex web of ideas and traditions which constituted the architectural scene at the turn of the century. Above all, I want you to bear in mind the problem of style, both for the designer and architect. The exhibition was poised exactly on the brink between adherence to the eclectic attitudes towards the styles of the past and the determination to devise a style for the future. But first, let's try and set the scene a little. Here's the centre of Paris. The area of the exhibition covered over a million square metres of land, half of which was covered over. Down near the Porte Monumental, they built two great exhibition areas, the Petit Palais and the Grand Palais. Across on the left bank was a big line of buildings on the Esplanade des Invalides. And then there were two lines of exhibition buildings following the two banks of the Seine. And then based on, on the Champ de Mar, the major area of the exhibition. You can see that the layout of the exhibition caused serious problems of communications. The exhibition visitors had to be able to move around the exhibition area, but at the same time, the life of central Paris was not to be disturbed. In particular, two main access routes had to be able to continue across the river without interruption, particularly across the Pont des Invalides here and the Pont de l'Alma here general traffic could pass freely over the bridge, while exhibition visitors could cross by the special footbridge erected on the left, without in any intermingling. Where the Avenue Rapp meets the Pont de l'Alma, special raised pedestrian walks were constructed to allow exhibition visitors to continue down the left bank along the Quai d'Orsay. But you didn't have to walk from one end of the exhibition to the other. Around 
this circuit here, you could pay to travel on an elevated electric railway. This was carried right across the center of Paris on an elevated track with stations provided inside the exhibition area. Running parallel to it was the most daring stroke of communications engineering in the exhibition, a raised electric moving platform. There was a stationary track and then a slow intermediary one traveling at four kilometers an hour and finally a faster one at eight kilometers an hour. Hand posts and a barrier provided security. Apart from the glory, propaganda, and commercial benefits brought about by the exhibition, what was left when it was all over? Almost all the exhibition architecture was purely temporary, except for two buildings, the Grand Palais and this one, the Petit Palais. The Petit Palais was begun in 1894 by Charles Giraud, and as one of the first buildings set the tone for the rest of the exhibition. It's a palace in the sense in which the man in the street could understand the term. Not only huge, but very solid, full of ornament, and bristling with academic architectural details. Everyone was impressed by the semicircular courtyard inside, with its twin columns and elegant detailing. Despite this orthodox detailing, the building had some original constructional engineering features. Notice the reinforced concrete ceiling in this corridor and the elegant self-supporting concrete staircase by Ennebeek. Most contemporary critics, on the other hand, were prepared to admit that the Grand Palais was a bit of a disaster. The colonnaded facade is not big enough to cover the stark metal and glass roof behind. The money and inspiration failed to quicken the huge expanses of stone and the central motif is particularly weak and is overscaled in relation to the wings. After all the external ornament, the interior is a real surprise. We find a huge glass and metal vault. It's a crude but powerful structure. The steel staircases are decorated in a tough but flamboyant manner. Now this kind of metalwork was familiar to the public from the interiors of functional buildings such as metro or railway stations. The twisted metal strips and punched fretwork perfectly suits the material. In the temporary exhibition buildings, dressing up a glorified railway shed, and most of the interiors were simple metal structures like this, to look on the outside like an architectural wedding cake became the supreme challenge of the exhibition and dominated most of the palaces. This one's the Palace of Mining and Metallurgy. The architects used all their skills to vary the style and decorative appearance of these pavilions. Here, the palaces on the Champ de Mars, for instance, are covered with decorative detail of one kind or another, particularly here on the pavilions, which form the entrance uh, halls to the palaces behind. This one is the Palace of Fine Arts here. It's very fanciful, particularly if we compare it to the Grand or the Petit Palais. And this is the pavilion of civil engineering in a very different Sionese idiom. On the Esplanade des Invalides, the industrial palaces were equally highly decorated. All this detail was executed in fibrous plaster to imitate stone. However distasteful it may seem now, this was done with great skill and ingenuity and helped to liven up what would otherwise have been endlessly long facades. In most of these temporary buildings, style was treated really rather light-heartedly by the French architects. But in the foreign national pavilions, a more serious stylistic program was intended. To the new arrival, they created a sort of guessing game. Try guessing the nationalities of the pavilions. Well, this one's the Italian pavilion, based on St. Mark's Venice in its style. It's covered with statues and niches and moulded Gothic detail, as well as much painted trente l'oeil work. This one's Turkey. And then the United States of America. 
Then comes Austria with a little Austrian Baroque palace and Bosnia-Herzegovina with its rather attractive views of blue and white walls and varied fenestration. Then comes Hungary. The guidebook says, One of the most brilliant reconstructions of the foreign sections. This pavilion reproduces marvellous streaks of genius from Hungarian architecture, from the Romanesque period to modern times. The British pavilion, at least, was in only one style at once. It was a replica of a Jacobean house, Kingston House at Bradford-on-Avon. The Monster Belgian Pavilion, a copy of a 15th century town hall at Odenard. And then the wooden Norwegian Pavilion, painted bright red and in a virile Scandinavian vernacular style. Then comes the German Pavilion, another resume of a fair share of different German styles. And then Spain and Monaco, a very big building for a very small state. And Sweden, which we'll come back to later. And then the first Byzantine church, surprisingly, represents Greece, while the second represents Serbia. Most of the nations, then, try to express their individuality by quoting directly from actual buildings in their country or trying to recap national styles. Well, France tried her hand at the same game across on the right bank, where she presented a quaint huddle of medieval buildings, a romantic reconstruction of old Parisian bygones. Complete with people dressed in historical costume, this section created a little idealized medieval world, which proved to be very popular. Pride of Place goes to Algeria at the colonial exhibition on the Trocadero site. Here was another example of the same theme, a sort of three-dimension whistle-stop tour of the world. Natives of these exotic and barbarous countries went about their traditional way of life. Or just stood around to be stared at. More sophisticated nations put on folkloric displays. The Egyptian theatre. The star, Tsohara, triumphs in the gargoulette dance. While the black Sudanese women shake in trance-like shudders and throw their shoulders, bosoms and heads into contortions a movement in which the stomach contributes an equal part. Cléo de Merode in the Indo-Chinese theatre. It's not quite Cambodian, but it's delicious. The symbol for this whole attitude can be found in the astonishing Tower of the World. The result of ten years of travel and study. It's a methodical jumble of as many national styles as the architect could fit in. Inside are painted panoramas. We are in China. The peach blossom is in flower, and the mauve flowers of the wisteria float in the wind. This Chinese town is so attractive to our European eyes, with its lacquered roofs, painted houses, and and long wall which unfold sinuously like a monstrous dragon. Two paces further, and we are in Spain. The sound of guitars and castanets, land of dreams, of which poets and musicians sing. The fabulous ruins of Angkor, in whose unknown depths are hidden inestimable treasures. In front, and quite modern, we see the Javanese dancers, the young sisters, or 
may be the daughters of those that were such a success in 1889. All this mind-boggling superfluity of different styles must have seemed as confusing as the babble of unintelligible tongues which the visitor was delighted to overhear. Style was used here simply to express character, like national costume or folkloric dancing displays. The serious intentions and meanings of classical architecture or Gothic architecture were lost, along with any idea of structural logic or truth to materials. To a surprising extent, however, contemporary critics did agree that it was precisely two of the less eclectic national pavilions which were among the most successful. The Swedish pavilion by Ferdinand Boberg, for instance, was built largely of notched and carved wood. The style derives loosely from local Swedish building traditions based on the use of wood. The yellow and white colouring suited the carnival atmosphere of the exhibition without abusing the style in which it was built. And Eliel Saarinen, in the Finnish pavilion, also used his materials intelligently and well. The form of a small village church well suits the scale of the construction. Many of the details were remarkably inventive. Contemporary critics were impressed by the way these Scandinavian buildings created new forms based on local vernacular traditions rather than harping back to the historicist approach to styles which had dominated 19th century architecture. We've looked at, some of the, at the structure of some of the exhibition buildings. I'm now going to look at some of the exhibits. Let's take an example. In the engineering palace, there was a transport section. And as in almost all the other 112 classes of objects on show, it had a musée retrospectif, a historical survey of recognized masterpieces in this one particular branch of design. Let's look now at the furniture section. Rooms in the style of the First Empire, of the Restoration, and of the July Monarchy. The Musée Retrospectif served two main purposes. Firstly, to set the modern exhibits in a historical context. And secondly, and this was much more obnoxious, to set a standard, and as often as not, to show models for modern imitation, like these chairs. Extremely successful firms, like Linkers, could produce furniture supposedly in a historical style. This desk is supposed to be Louis XVI, which nevertheless were adapted to modern florid taste. Now, Art Nouveau designers were thrown into competition with these historical styles. This room, exhibited by Charles Plumet and Tony Selmersheim, contains many attractive and beautifully sophisticated pieces. The subtly restrained carving of the chair and table is typical of the new attitude to organic form. The carving emphasizes the sinuous rippling qualities the material is capable of, but doesn't weigh down the form with too many details. These are qualities which you see in the works of other Art Nouveau designers. This is Samuel Bing's Art Nouveau Pavilion. In all these objects, there's a continuity of purpose. The work of designers like Colonna, and Majorelle, which being exhibited, was beautifully sophisticated. But it was particularly difficult to appreciate this sort of restrained and elegant modern design in the heightened atmosphere of the exhibition. Many of the more ephemeral structures exploited the decorative freedom postulated by Art Nouveau in a more uninhibited way. This funfair display cheapened serious design, but many people mistook it for true Art Nouveau. But not all interior designers were immune to excesses of this kind either. This hideous vegetal fireplace is by Edmond Lachenal, and yet it was described in the catalogue as being in the modern style. With the champagne pavilion in the food hall, the designer seems suitably inebriated. All big exhibitions produce frivolities of this kind, and they help us to see how contemporary imagination runs when released from conventional constraints. On the facade of this milk pavilion, cats are shown climbing up to enjoy the cream running over from the milk vats. 
The designers were symbolizing the product shown in the building in as attractive a way as possible to seduce the public. Perhaps the most bizarre structure that posed as Art Nouveau was the entrance arch by René Binet, a really monstrous structure with a three-pointed arch supporting a dome which squatted uncomfortably over the rear of the edifice. This too lit up at night with coloured electric light bulbs reflecting through thousands of coloured glass baubles. But among all the excessive attempts to attract the public's interest are some buildings of real structural and aesthetic interest. This is the Pavilion Bleu, with its suggestion of daring structural techniques. One commentator observed, One of the most charming corners of the exhibition. It's so agreeable to sit here after a morning's promenade. And I can assure you that despite the modern style of the building, the hospitality is far from Scottish. Testimony to the prejudices towards the Scottish designers and the Glasgow School, which were obviously shared by sections of the public. The issue of novelty and tradition was therefore complicated rather than elucidated by the exhibition. One or two serious designers apart, most new designers appeared to be as much characterized by excess as the extreme examples of eclecticism. An example is the Grand Palais, which we saw earlier. You can see what the 1900 exhibition failed to do if you look at the Turin exhibition of 1902, where a consciously modernistic program was built into the regulations of the exhibition. This is the automobile pavilion. The exhibition architect, Raimondo Daronco, tried to create a uniform style in all the exhibition buildings. And this is the photographic pavilion. There are no remnants here of historicism, but a serious attempt to create a completely new style for exhibition architecture. The emphasis is on bold, curving forms with clear, crisp surfaces onto which swirling ornament can be applied. This is Bernhard Pancock's Art Nouveau study, which had also been exhibited at Paris in 1900, but at Turin, Art Nouveau furniture could be seen to better advantage. And this sitting room is by the great Viennese architect, J. M. Olbrich, who greatly admired Mackintosh. Of course, the Turin exhibition was a limited exercise expressly intended to promote modern design. But to celebrate the first year of the 20th century, the French still felt they had to put everything in. The universal international exhibition was meant to represent the art and industry of all times and all places. The result, was chaos. <laughs>